So welcome back to the co conference, everybody. Um, my name is Susan Robinson. I'm a member of the planning committee. I'm a palliative care nurse practitioner and an educator in North Bay, Ontario. And it is my honor today to introduce Dr. Jose Pereira, our next speaker, talking about the COVID pandemic and its impacts on palliative care. Um, Dr. Pereira is a palliative care physician and professor at the Division of Palliative Care at the Department of Family Medicine at McMaster University. He is also co-founder and scientific officer of Pallium Canada, a not-for-profit foundation and organization founded 22 years ago to build a primary care capacity across care settings, professions, specialties, and disease groups through education. Pallium Canada trains about 9,000 healthcare professionals a year on a palliative approach to care, and he has a master's degree and a PhD in education. He's worked in numerous care settings and has developed local and regional palliative care programs and initiatives. Currently, uh, Dr. Pereira is on sabbatical for the year at University of Navarra in Spain. Welcome, and we look forward to your talk. very much. Uh, thanks, Susan, and thanks for the very kind invitation. It's quite an honor. Um, it's getting a bit late here. It's about, uh, actually, it's not too late. It's eight, it's seven o'clock in the in the evening uh, up in north, northeastern Spain in Pamplona, known for the running of the bulls, and I can assure you that's not something that I'm going to attempt. So let me try and um, get my presentation up and running. And just let me know if you can see it, please. Oh, it's still, yeah, I can see it now. Okay, perfect. Um, thanks very much. So I was asked to speak about the impact of the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, um, specifically around palliative care and, and how do we move forward um, into the future, um, having experienced that and in some cases still experiencing it. Um, and um, and asking ourselves, what have we learned from it? And what should we do going into the future? I'd entitled my presentation, Two Steps Forward or Three Steps Back. And as I reflected more and more on the presentation, I think perhaps it should rather be two steps back and three steps forward. And um, I, I suspect in Bruce Springsteen's song somewhere, um, it might say that two steps back and three steps forward means that we're still going forward, which is in the right direction. And I think that that is where we're going. Um, so at the end of this presentation, I'm hoping that you'll be able to describe the impact of the pandemic, um, uh, particularly on the delivery of palliative care across different settings, and describe the ways in which the pandemic has set palliative care backwards, but also ways in which it has set move things forward and I would argue set the stage for for ongoing system improvement um, and and change where that's needed. As you heard, I'm scientific, I'm actually scientific advisor at Pallium Canada. So I get honorarium or stipend uh, when I do work there. Um, I don't have any honoraria from industry. Um, during the pandemic, uh, we were um, hosting at Pallium uh, COVID-19 webinars, um, and the webinars were designed so we could learn from each other across the country as we were learning new things about this new illness. And we were very fortunate to get um, funding from Beringer Ingelheim to hold that. So what I'm hoping to do today is uh, divide the presentation up into five parts, actually. The first one is the COVID-19 experience, and I'm sure well, I know all of you on this conference call had one or other experience, both positive and, and negative, I'm sure. The second part, I'm hoping to unpack what happened. And in the third part is to reflect um, on or to move from reflection about what happened to action. And then I'd like to share what I think are some priorities. And you can imagine there are many, many priorities, I'm sure, if I asked each one of you to grab a piece of paper and list what you think are priorities going forward. I'm sure we're going to have hundreds of them um, coming out from such a large group. So I'll share what I think are some of the key ones, and then we'll end off and hopefully there'll be time. 
um, for for questions and discussion. I'm, I'm sure there will be time for, for some discussion. So let's look at the first one, the COVID-19 experience. So the impact in general, I think if we all reflect on it, um, particularly in those earlier waves, um, was the tragic loss of life and great morbidity, was the fear that went around it. Um, I remember those uh, you know, those, those early weeks where we knew very little about what was happening. At that time, I actually reached out to colleagues that I had in um, in Italy and also actually in this place that I'm now, which is uh, Pamplona, because Spain and Italy were hit quite hard um, in those first waves. And we learned an enormous amount of what was happening there, and we then tried to apply that um, in our work in Canada. We learned about the, we saw and uh, firsthand and, uh, and experienced the burden on patients, families and, and healthcare providers. And that was across all sectors, hospitals, in the home, long-term care in particular. Um, as we all know, there was a major toll on long-term care with in those early waves, 80% of the deaths from COVID-19 were actually occurring in the long-term care sector. Uh, but we do know it impacted all the sectors. It required considerable rearranging of um, services um, of the healthcare system um, and often reconfiguring. In some cases, priorities had to be changed in, um, and, and what were previous priorities sometimes fell behind, as we're hearing about some of the elective surgeries, for example. Um, in palliative care, we heard stories of some of the grief and bereavement programs, ironically, could not be held um, and either had to change to something virtual or had to shut down. We also saw across many sectors, many clinicians uh, with limited palliative care education uh, training being called to provide palliative and end of life care. Uh, one particular story comes to mind where um, I was working on a palliative care unit um, in Hamilton at the time, and we had a patient that had to go to the larger hospital for further investigations, not related to COVID. This is related to complications from uh, from her cancer. And so we sent the patient across by ambulance, and that afternoon we got a phone call from a relatively junior resident who berated us for not having done this and that and this and that. and completely oblivious to the fact that this patient had very advanced disease um, and some of those interventions or tests that he was suggesting um, actually were very inappropriate in this situation. And for me, it highlighted the importance of more training across the whole healthcare system so everyone has these basic core skill sets. Um, it added a lot of stress and burden um, and I would add burnout to those clinicians as well. Um, you can imagine what it's like being thrown into the deep end of something when you've not been trained for it and you're going to have to just find your way and keep your head above water as you swim through those um, um, stormy stormy waters. Some decisions were bizarre as well and for me one of the most bizarre ones was um, in in the region that I was working in at the time the long-term care sector was approached by the palliative care team saying, we can support, we can help. And it opted rather to turn to the emergency departments to, to support them. Now, I can understand that from a certain perspective. Like You've got patients now with in acute respiratory distress. Who, what do you do? And it made sense that the emergency department um, clinicians, the doctors and nurses there, the technicians there, were well equipped to deal with that. But they themselves knew very enough, very little about palliative care. So we ended up in an interesting situation in Hamilton where we had to, on the fly, quickly take off the shelf uh, one of Pallium Leap's courses, adapt it somewhat, and to train the emergency doctors and nurses on how to support long-term care, providing palliative care in long-term care. So one of those strange things that happened uh, we saw the ethics of rationing um, highlighted um, in the press. Um, and I'll come back to that. I think one of the um, 
one of the victims of the pandemic was the concept of early palliative care. You know, we've been really trying hard to move palliative care early in the illness trajectory to demystify to demystify it, to destigmatize it from being something that's only at the very end of life in the last days or weeks. And when the pandemic hit all over the news, people were being told, well, you know, there's the option of either um, ventilation or the treatments or palliative care. And so I would argue that um, unfortunately, that's one of those steps back that we took as a result of the pandemic, that people that that stigma was 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 emphasized when it when the media spoke largely about palliative care in the context of withdrawing um, ventilation uh, or withholding ventilation uh, and at the very end of life in the last um, hours or days. We saw in the home and community sector care shifted to families and fortunately in many cases they were home. Um, I think that that actually showed that um, that home care and home deaths is possible and can be good. But I think we also need to stop and reflect on why did why was it possible to increase the number of home deaths in, in most regions? I, I'm generalizing, right? So obviously there there are regions with some exceptions. And I think one of the main reasons was that obviously the family were at home because they couldn't be at work. And during, uh, soon after those first few waves, I started hearing people saying that we should reduce hospices and um, and palliative care units um, at, because now we've seen that many more home deaths are possible. But I think we need to stop um, and think about why was it possible, what was possible, because there were families at home. So there was someone to care for them. But that, I think, going forward is not going to be the ongoing reality. And if we're going to... Um, in, improve and increase the home care and home debts, which we should. It's going to require an investment and a lot of support and a lot of help. We saw during the pandemic a rapid transition to virtual care um, and people trying to find the right platform, the right protocols. Um, interestingly, some professions were not provided the tools. I remember a meeting uh, once where the home care nurses said, well, but we've got no way of of, of, of doing virtual care. Um, we weren't issued with the equipment and we're not allowed to use um, something like Zoom because of um, security concerns. Um, PPE shortages occurred um, in all sectors, as we know, and there was scrambling and fear. Um, but I, th I think that overall, Canada then did quite well in terms of getting PPE and getting it to the front line. It did take one or two waves, and it was quite scary at the time, but it, it did come. The home care workforce uh, took a major hit um, with restrictions on working across settings and sites in particular, because unfortunately, a lot of the workforce in the home care um, sector and in long-term care have to hold two or three jobs and across sectors, and they weren't allowed to do that. So it was a double whammy. It was a whammy on the care provider who now couldn't do this. And it was also a whammy on those different sites because um, some of the workers couldn't come in and work because they were uh, having to um, focus on only one of the sites. Oops, sorry. In the media, we heard a lot about the what is happening but with with I would say very negative reporting and some and some of it um, correct you know um, there were major gaps uh, without a doubt and and I think it's fair to say that the pandemic really um, shone a light on many of those gaps including the workforce um, shortages um, lack of of the um, of resources into that sector. Um, but as I'm going to show you shortly as well, fantastic things were also happening. And I don't think that those made it enough to to the media and the spotlight. And I think in the process of that, many of these uh, colleagues who were doing amazing work in long-term care um, felt quite demoralized that all was painted was that, you know, this very bleak, dark picture that was that was happening. They were doing their best. Um, in that sector, everyone was trying to do their best. You know, we saw 
in the long-term care, the impact on residents and families and staff through the visiting restrictions where grief was amplified, um, people dying alone. And that wasn't obviously only in long-term care. That happened as well in the hospitals. It happened on palliative care units, um, guilt of the family. And I think we're still going to be seeing the lingering effects of this separation and the inability to be present um, at someone's passing. The frustration, fear, anxiety, and anger we heard from all sides, from uh, residents, from families, and the staff as well. And one of the unique things I thought was that families who had not been prepared to engage in, or in other words, had not been um, approached to engage in advanced care planning and goals of care discussions, now had to do this, and had to do this in a moment of crisis, and moreover, had to do this with the new technology that that most of us were not really used to. In some cases, there was an impetus to move residents out of long-term care. And we heard in one study that I'll come back to shortly, that the distress that caused to um, a lot of the staff who felt that you know, we could care for them here, but they were uh, taken away. So this is the study I'm referring to. It was um, led by a, a colleague, uh, Sandy Shimon, who um, works in the long-term care sector. Um, and some other colleagues, including Sharon Kaslanen and Lynn Meadows from Calgary, Sharon Kaslanen from McMaster University, and Sharon has done amazing work over the years in the long-term care sector, and, um, and I, I'll come back to one of her works um, quite shortly. We interviewed um, clinicians. So this is clinicians. It wasn't the patients and families. It wasn't the personal support workers, the other staff. This was the clinicians. So in other words, the physicians and the nurses, the nurse practitioners um, working in long-term care at the time. And we interviewed them to, exp to learn from them what the experience was like. What was the lived experience uh, during the time? And several themes emerged, uh, each of them with some sub-themes. One of the themes was the importance of providing a path of care approach and highlighted several times was how some of the homes who had prepared themselves for it, in other words, prior to the pandemic, had been integrating the path of care approach throughout the long term care by way of policies of an internal team, an internal champion or champion team by way of education with programs like um, the Pallium Leap long term care or CAPSI or fundamentals. Those um, felt they did they did much better in terms of providing part of an end of life care during the pandemic. Having said that, however, we also heard stories of some homes that had trained up staff, and then the very staff that they trained couldn't come in because they were they were either sick or they had to work in another sector. Um, and there were experiences shared of, for example, army personnel with all the best intention coming in to try help, but not having any training on providing part of an end of life care. The other big, um, so the uncertainty was a big, big theme, especially in those first few ways where we, we knew very little about the disease. We were seeing patients turn on a dime. They were doing fine in the morning within a few hours, they were dying. Um, we weren't sure how to, what the best protection was, um, how to uh, protect the patient and how to protect the families. Many, many times spouses and partners who are frail themselves. So hence, I think a lot of the um, isolation that occurred and the restrictions that occurred. We've learned now the impact of that um, in a very negative way. But looking back, when there's so much uncertainty, um, I can't fault uh, public health officials who had to make um, very difficult decisions. I'm sure it wasn't easy for them. The other thing was increased demands. So I've already described some of the staffing challenges, but interestingly, there were role changes. So there was one story of, for example, um, one clinician saying, I just spent the time bagging, putting uh, bodies into bags, which I'd never done, and, and that is very traumatic. There were leaders in the long-term care, managers, leaders stepping in to do frontline si bedside care, feeding feeding the residents. So a lot of stories about added responsibility, stepping up to the plate and going the extra mile, especially around being present at the, at the bedside of someone who's dying and was alone because the family couldn't come in. We've all heard about the supply and resource shortages, including shortages of oxygen at, at times. 
we heard stories about communication, collaboration, um, having to communicate a lot more with families because I guess uh, that that distance, uh, that physical distancing that occurred. But the power of internal communication, how um, team members start speaking more with each other, learning more from each other and supporting each other. And we heard as well stories about long-term care homes reaching out to peers, reaching out to other long-term care homes and reaching out to external resources. So there was this this mobilization of know-how, mobilization of tacit knowledge that was being captured on the fly. And I think that that's a fantastic lesson because it shows that that is possible and we can do it. Theme four was the impact of isolation, visitation, restrictions, and I'm sure you've all experienced that. Um, theme five was the impact on the clinician's personal lives. We heard stories of burnout. We heard stories of impact on family life, um, spending uh, many, many long hours in the long-term care home, sometimes actually s sleeping there and staying there for days and days and days to help and support. Um, we heard stories about the moral distress and emotional trauma of now having to care for a lot more people because the family weren't in to be at the bedside, um, added responsibilities, and knowing that this is not the ideal care we're providing. We could be doing better, but we just don't have the bandwidth um, and the resources to be able to do that. But the story that came out so often was going the extra mile and reaching out. And there are tons of quotes. Um, I won't go through them now, but just to highlight, um, I just want to highlight some of them. There was one, um, I think the most memorable is the care that was given by the PSWs and RPNs, the dedication they had to those residents, the love that they showed them when their families weren't around. There's a story of one uh, manager walking past a room and seeing the PSW sat, sitting at the bedside, holding the person's hand and singing. Um, and, and those stories often didn't make it to the press. And I think it's time that, uh, you know, that people hear about them. Um, there is a lot of heroic, wonderful work happening in the middle of a, a disastrous situation. So I've described the impact on the staff, the workloads, um, the moral distress, the public scrutiny. Um, there was communication breakdown, and so they had to improvise. And it showed the power, the power and the ability to improvise, the lack of the PPE. Um, importantly, we heard over and over again the importance of education and training up all staff about the palliative care approach. And that we heard across the sectors. I told you the story about the emergency department um, folks reaching out to us urgently saying, please train us up quickly on what the palliative care approach is. We received calls from uh, folks in the, in the hospital sector. Um, at Pallium Canada, we were, you know, those first few weeks, we were pivoting, we were changing those courses that were not available online onto online. And we probably taught more people um, in that first year of the pandemic, or at least, at least as many as we did in the previous year. So in 2019, there were just over 9,000 healthcare professionals across the country that completed one other LEAP course. And we almost achieved the same numbers during that first year. We also learned about um, medication shortages. Um, we had one horror story that happened in, in the region where I was living at the time, well, in, in, that, in the Hamilton, Burlington region, in that the main supplier of medications to the community pharmacies, so these, uh, so um, the distributor of the medications that then goes to the pharmacies and then to home care and supporting patients at home got hacked and held hijacked with a hacker. Um, and that's, believe it or not, and, then, uh, and that stopped down the delivery of medications with some critical medications not, reach, not being able to, um, to arrive at the patient's home. And this included opioids and things like midazolam. But across the sectors, we heard of shortages of medications like midazolam and highlighted the importance of us thinking about this in the future. And we actually published a paper on this as we ex explored why was this happening, what are the root causes, what needs to happen, and what are some strategies to save um, the medications. And one of the things was 
you know, around the emergency kit. So the emergency kits have become, I think, very useful, widely used across the country. Um, but I think this makes us pause a little bit and ask ourselves, how are you, how are we using these kits? Um, in some situations, I would argue in peripheral rural areas where there is no 24-7 access to a pharmacist that can get medications out to you within an hour or two. And there it makes sense to have a kit with all the medications. But in the larger centers, we should be looking at processes, I would argue, that can mobilize the medications and supplies very quickly and get them to the patients within an hour um, or two, rather than have these boxes or bags with all these supplies and all the medications, half if not more, never get used, but cannot be put back into the system because the law states or the regulations are that once they've been issued to a patient, they can't come back into the system. So a lot of waste um, happening there. We saw the development of um, guidelines, clinical guidelines and protocols um, happening very quickly. Um, at McMaster, we developed the continuous pad of sedation protocol specifically for the pandemic. And that we had, that was really posted, um, I think it was the last week of March. The shutdown went, occurred on the 15th or 16th of March or somewhere around there. And by the end of March, we had it out. So we really worked hard to get that out. But the, I think the only reason why we were able to do it so quickly, and this is a group of about 14 experts working on it, was because we were able to leverage what was there before. So we found a fantastic protocol in the Kitchener-Waterloo uh, region um, on pad of sedation. We asked the permission if we could use that and um, adapt it for what was happening. And that sped the process a lot. So one of the lessons learned is uh, leverage what already has, what one already has. Now, the one thing that we could not find was a PPE, a protocol on how to don or doff uh, PPE in the home. So in the hospitals, it was quite easy because in the hospitals, well, it was still challenging, but it was easier than home because in the hospitals, you had a tray, there was a table, the equipment was all there. There was a nice poster that showed you how to put it on inside as opposed to showing you how to take it off. And then you discarded into a bag and walked away and and you knew that someone would go and 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 remove the the um, um, uh, the the material you know the the, the gowns etc but in the home that wasn't there there's no poster you know there's no nice table outside a patient's home that says here's all your PPE this is how you don it uh, step by step at the end when you doff then um, what do you do with it and so we organized a group of um, clinicians working in the community in this in that first week or two weeks, and we started simulating what it was like and putting together as best we could um, the protocols. Be what I've called the PPE in the home saga. Because I thought, I think we saw, at least for the group working on this, we saw the best and we saw the worst of what the healthcare system can be like. The best in that, Hi, sorry, there's just a, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, perfect, thank you. Um, so there was a group of people working flat out um, late into the evenings, early mornings to simulate um, a situation of donning and doffing in the home. We had done extensive literature search looking for protocols. We had gone through the gray literature. We had gone through websites looking for something that we could use to make sure that the home care teams were supported, uh, were protected, and that the patients and families were also protected. And we couldn't find it, hence the work done on this. And while we were working on this, we got so much a pushback from uh, from from quarters that we weren't expecting from, including some of the regional uh, part of care um, uh, 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 folks um, who were saying that you know the protocol we we're doing was was going to lead to waste of of um, PPE, and we were saying actually 
it's very clear in the protocol this protocol is only real is only applicable once you've applied the criteria for when is it that you need to use PPE or not but once you've done that then what do you do at the bedside anyway it while we were developing this and putting it out we were having to almost fight this battle in the background to say this is important if, if show us where there is a protocol and there was no protocol um, but so we're very proud of then having actually uh, got this published very quickly in the Annals of Family Medicine, one of the top journals in the world in primary care. But it is a pity that um, that we had to deal with some of the politics in the background as well. Um, in education, we saw rapid adoption of virtual learning um, right across the whole learning journey, undergraduate training, postgraduate, and into continuing professional development. Um, as I said, we saw a major pick up in at Pallium of the of the leap online self learning modules and the map just shows where all the learners were across the country that had downloaded it and were accessing it. We saw fantastic utilization of the webinars. Um, at times we had 300 to 400 people and sometimes 800 up to some of these webinars where we brought um, experts from across the country who were experiencing this firsthand to share with us their insights and what they were learning on, on various topics from part of care in the community. Sorry, I got a message saying I was muted, but I yeah. don't think. We lost okay. your picture just for a minute. OK, good. Well, that's a relief, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, Okay. Um, so we also saw the, <laughs> we also saw the lighter side, and I've got to share with you that some of them might be politically incorrect, but I just I have such a laugh when I see them, like the 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 the, the dinosaurs, a meteorite. Quick, let's go get toilet paper. <laughs> and I remember how we were all scrambling for toilet paper <laughs> in those first few weeks, myself included, in my family. Um, I love the one on the left there with the protective gear lining up to buy a ticket and some lessons from our animal friends. It's for your own good. You have to stop touching your face. There we go. So let's move on to the second part, and that's unpacking what happened. So we saw, as I said, the impact of isolation we saw the impact of moral distress um, adding, I think, to the to burnout of short, of the workforce that is really short staffed and overwhelmed. Um, we experienced some service and payment models making it very difficult to mobilize, pivot and, and restructure. So an example is that in the Hamilton region, there is a uh, an alternative payment plan uh, for physicians. Um, there is uh, funding for nurse practitioners, and with those fundings are certain um, requirements or restrictions. One of them, for example, was that the nurse practitioners were not allowed to go into the long-term care sector, um, which was really bizarre because the, our part of care nurse practitioners, with all their fantastic experience and know-how, could have uh, in some cases made um, a, a big difference, but weren't allowed to do that. And also with the physician APP, because of some restrictions, we weren't able to move people around to other um, settings um, in order to address some urgent priorities in those areas. Um, we heard about the lack of the part of care skills across the workforce and the importance of education, the importance of education. I just want to highlight that so often. Um, and then we also saw clinical gaps caused by virtual care. So I think one of the things was that virt that we learned is that virtual care is possible and it can be effective and make a difference. We also learned that there's some shortcomings with it. And I think moving forward, oh, I see some people have lost all connection. So I don't know whether I'm still connected or not. You are? You are? Yeah, OK. So it's probably something there at their end. Hopefully not at my end. The bulls have not yet destroyed the infrastructure at this end. Um, 
advanced care planning and goals of care discussions were highlighted, which I thought that's one of the steps going forward. Um, I don't think there's been for a long time any event or or um, or happening that has highlighted this important area as much as the as the pandemic did. And as I said, we learned that home death is possible. Um, for many, for those of us who are, who are care providers, we learned the privilege that, uh, that it is of being a care provider, whether you're a healthcare professional or a caregiver. I experienced this personally. So in last year, at the end of March, I got a phone call. Um, so those of you, some of you may recognize my accent. I was born and raised in South Africa. I spent 30 years, I've spent 30 years in Canada, but I think I still kept my South African accent. Um, but I am of Portuguese origin and Portuguese background, and my home language is Portuguese. So half my, lang half my family are in Portugal, the other half in South Africa. At the end of March, I got a phone call from my uh, siblings uh, and my mother in South Africa to say, your dad's very ill. My father has uh, moderate dementia and also has um, significant renal impairment and also significant heart failure. And so I got on a plane, flew to South Africa, was with him in the, in the ICU. We were able to get him out of the ICU, got him home. And then unfortunately, uh, we had a family member who came to visit us who was feeling sick and didn't wear um, a mask or protection and we ended up all with COVID. So my dad was really, really sick. Um, I, 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 I felt it quite badly as well as did my mum, but it was just the three of us in a relatively small apartment um, for almost four weeks because we weren't, we, we remained positive, COVID positive for a long time. Um, and my mum, uh, who's frail, and I caring for my father, who was completely bedridden, need was 100% dependent on, on everything. Um, and I must say, looking back, it was one of the toughest times for me personally, but also probably one of the most enriching experiences that I've had, being able to be present and care for a loved one and making a difference. Um, so I think we've all we've all had those stories. We also learned that there are gaps, there are strengths that we can harness and leverage, and there are also gaps that we do need to fix. As I said before, I think the concept of early palliative care has been an unintended victim, and we need to do now extra work to get the message out. We learned that we can pivot, and we learned that we can change, and we can innovate when we really need to. And I think that is a fantastic, liberating uh, lesson, because we sometimes get so caught up in trying to improve things, and we get caught up on some of the bureaucracy and and this and we can't do that because of this and you can't do that because of that and um, but we learned that actually you know if you really have to you can make changes and sometimes they can be big and transformational and make a difference sometimes they're just small little tweaks that are needed and we also learned that decisions can be made quickly we learned that preparation does help those folks in the long-term care homes um, who had done some training felt a lot more equipped than those who hadn't. Similarly, in, in the hospitals, um, we heard similar experiences. We learned about the power of teamwork and observing the power of narrative, both good and bad. And by that, I mean, there was this narrative the whole time, for example, of long-term care falling apart, falling apart. And I'm not trying to under, um, I'm not trying to downplay the gaps that exist and the shortcomings that exist in that sector without a doubt and we've seen many reports have highlighted and we've and we saw it as well but we, we should also stop and give some time for the innovation and the amazing work with the people going the extra mile that was happening as well we also learned that we're all only human we also burn out and we exhaust we get exhausted and that it is okay to reach out and say i'm burnt out i'm exhausted and what we need to do is learn how to support each other and um, how the system can support us, how we can support the system as well. The system is also exhausted and we're part of what we call the system. We are part of that. Um, we learned about the agility and the power of being agile and we saw excellent resources emerge. From Dr. Michael Ryan at the World Health Organization in those early weeks 
and months we learned that speed trumps perfection in a pandemic. So that PPE protocol that we put out, we deliberately said, this is the best we have at the moment. As we learn more, let us know how we can modify it. And we did actually make uh, two modifications as we went along. Um, some input we received from as far as Australia and from the United States. The journal very, I think, astutely um, added sort of a blog or a messaging thing to the paper and said, um, there's a request here from the authors to please help uh, provide this further. So, um, so that did happen. Um, we also learned, as Rainier Rilke, the poet, um, once wrote, that we have to learn to live the question. There were so many questions, and in healthcare, I think in modern healthcare, we are we're driven by answers for everything, which is a good thing, right? Because that leads to discovery, that leads to innovation, um, to research. But there are sometimes things that that occur that happen that we don't have answers for. Uh, why the suffering? Um, this new virus, uh, we're trying to learn more about it, but we don't know about it. So we've got to learn to live those questions. And I think too often we're quick at pointing fingers at people like our public health officials who were doing the best they could under the circumstances, the hospital leaders, the long-term care leaders, the management who was doing the best, they were doing the best they could under the circumstances. And yes, sometimes there were missteps. But again, as Michael Ryan said, speed trumps perfection in a pandemic, and we learn as we go along. We also learned that Zoom cannot see everything. So the importance of the visits at the bedside. And I think moving forward, we're going to have to find this right balance, harnessing the technology that we've now actually become very used to, um, but not forgetting the important role of of being at the bedside of holding, touching the person, examining them, them, examining them, seeing what the room looks like. Because being in a room, many of you do home visits, and um, which I've done before, you learn a lot about the circumstances just by walking in through that front door, just by driving into the neighborhood, by walking to that front door and seeing uh, inside what's happening. Now, imagine if after all of this, we did nothing. Imagine after all the deaths, the morbidity, the the um, extra work, the fatigue that's gone into it, we did nothing to improve the gaps that we identified. What would those who died or those who continue to suffer from the sequelae of the disease say to us if they found out that, okay, this happened, it's put in the past, we're going to do nothing, we're just going to carry on as though nothing happened. So I think that there is an opportunity for transformational change. And we've seen that it is possible. And it, but it does take courageous leadership. It takes a common vision. And it does take everyone to help out. And importantly, at some point, we sometimes need to stop and say, OK, the system that we think is best, is it best for whom? In whose best interests are we serving? Um, we're in the process, a team. Um, I'm leading a team that's been commissioned to do an external review in uh, one of the big regions um, in the country. Fantastic work happening there. And we took an appreciative inquiry approach. So we said, OK, what, what are the strengths that we can leverage and harness and use as stepping stones moving forward? And what are the things that we can um, that we need to suggest to make recommendations about to fix? And a common theme that's coming out is that sometimes the system is set up with not the patient in, in mind, but um, what's more convenient for the physician or the nurse or whoever it is. And I think we need to be really honest um, with self-reflection um, about this. And 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 remember, the, the pandemic is not over. COVID is still happening. Um, I've seen it here. Um, I flew recently back from Canada um, through Europe, and I was surprised that some airlines not even wearing masks anymore. And you hear people coughing. I, I I wear a mask right through because I think we we're not out of this yet, and it's going to linger around for a long time. But we know a lot more about it. So having said that, now so we spoke about what the impact was. We looked at uh, the lessons learned. So now let's just see how we can take reflection into action. And I'm going to use 
start with an analogy on the right hand side. So I told you earlier about my Portuguese roots and I'm still very connected with Portugal. Um, the tiles you see are typical tiles that you see around Portugal. And in the top where it says 2000, I would argue that if you look across the country, that's what it looked like. Um, um, areas of excellence, and you can see that in some of those beautiful, almost perfect tiles. Areas uh, where that are not too bad, the tiles looking pretty good, but there's some cracks in some areas that need to be fixed. There are some other tiles that need a lot of fixing, but at least you've got some something there that you can work with, and then you've got these big gaps. And this, for me, illustrates what it looked like in 2000. By 2022, I think we've come a long way, but there are still quite a few tiles that still need fixing, and there's still a few gaps. We still don't have enough out of care resources in in some re in hospitals we don't have enough home care resources in some regions and and it's got really difficult to address because of the pandemic and the impact it had on the workforce um, and so what is it going to look like as we strive forward so we get this beautiful panel a uh, perfect panel of uh, when i say perfect there's always a few blemishes remember perfection is not possible and I remember many years ago, a few years ago, actually, I did the Camino uh, the, the Santiago from, from France across to Santiago, northwestern Spain. And one particular afternoon, I was walking in a forest, came around the corner, and there was this big boulder. And on the, on the boulder was written, God does not ask you to be perfect. He just asks you to keep trying. And I think that's such a good lesson. Uh, we're not perfect, but we, as long as we just keep trying and keep working at this. Um, so... The, the point of the slide is that there are very good things and that we can harness and leverage, but, but we also need to see where we can improve. And I think more than uh, any other time, we've learned how we need to think beyond the triple aim and go to the quadruple aim. So those of you who do quality improvement um, have heard of the Institute of Healthcare Improvement's triple aim. And the triple aim came out oh, a few decades ago to say, we need to improve the system and the three areas to focus on the triple aim are improve the patient experience, get better health outcomes, so better quality, and become more efficient. In other words, lower the healthcare costs. And in 2014, uh, a group of family physicians in the state said there's actually a very important fourth dimension, a fourth aim, and that is to improve the care provider experience. So while we're trying to fix up the system, if we burden an already overburdened workforce, this is not going to go well. And this is important. We can't forget about that because one of the areas I'm going to be highlighting very soon is we need to build primary part of care capacity across all sectors, get more healthcare professionals trained up on how to do that, including family physicians, home care nurses, primary care providers. But there's a new reality today, a reality, I would argue, of a workforce that's stretched to the limit, a workforce that's, that's really burnt, exhausted. And so we have to take that into consideration because if we don't, we're going to cause more damage on, uh, on the fourth, the quadruple aim, the fourth aim. So now how do we go from good to great? Um, and we sometimes hear about evolution, that it's better to evolve, do th build on things that were there before and evolve those. But we sometimes also hear about complete disruptions, where sometimes something is so broken it needs to be completely started from scratch and built from scratch. And we look at the, you know, the construction world um, can teach us a few lessons. Sometimes it's worthwhile renovating an old house. And I learned that because I tried to renovate a 300-year-old house in Portugal, and it's ongoing work, but it was worthwhile. But sometimes it's better tearing down something and building it from scratch because the work and effort that goes into trying to renovate it is just not worth it, and sometimes a complete reorganization is needed. And I think going forward, we're going to have to have the wisdom to discern between what needs an evolution and and what needs a disruption. And we're going to need courageous leadership and courageous action for 
both the evolutionary part of it, because sometimes there are barriers that stop us from moving forward, and definitely if it's going to be a large redo, a large disruption. And I just want to share a bit of an example of what I mean by a disruption. So back in Halifax in October 2014, this is a photo, um, uh, myself here with a few um, paramedics and a few emergency room doctors, two of them actually specialists as well in both palliative care and emergency medicine. And we had been um, uh, chatting to colleagues in the paramedic services in Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island about how about if the paramedics could do palliative care? Because if you think about it, they are the ones who get often called to these emergency crisis situations at home. And often the protocols stated or state that they then need to transport that patient into hospital. Sometimes um, uh, those admissions or those transfers could be um, perhaps not, uh, not appropriate. Some of them are without a doubt, but some of them could have been um, avoided if the paramedics had some training. Um, and the emergency room doctors at the other end of the line that the paramedics have to call also had the same training, the palliative care approach. And so this is where we started the whole development of the LEAP paramedics. We mapped out what the competencies were that were required working with paramedics and their leaders and their educators that gave rise to LEAP paramedics at the same time the paramedic services in Nova Scotia PI were modifying some of their policies and procedures to allow the paramedics to care for patients at home. And that's just the, um, how we developed those competencies at the time. And so what's evolved has been the paramedics providing pad of care. And I'm really proud to see this has uh, gone across the whole country. Um, we've published some of it and now we're seeing more and more of it appearing in many different provinces. Um, Leap. I know that there, for example, are some partnerships between some provinces like British Columbia, Alberta, um, most or many regions in Ontario, uh, Nova Scotia, PEI, a few other provinces that are collaborating with uh, Pallium to, uh, with, with their uh, LEAP paramedics and making adjustments that are appropriate for that particular jurisdiction. So there's an example of something that was disruptive um, and we're seeing results. This was a report back in 2017 from the Alberta group, uh, having done LEAP paramedics and changed their protocols and their policies, they started seeing significant reductions in emergency department uh, transfers with more people staying at home, dying at home, and overall uh, people are staying in their preferred place of, uh, of care and thereby reducing significantly costs to the healthcare system and reducing pressures on emergency departments. Another area that I think is somewhat disruptive in some parts of, of Ontario um, relates to the models of practice. And so we've developed this conceptual model of, um, of a spectrum where at one end of the spectrum is what we refer to as consultation, in the middle of the spectrum is shared care, and in the other end of the spectrum is takeover model. Let me explain this. Um, a palliative care physician working in a hospital, for example, or let's just say in the community, they can be they can get a referral to see a patient, and they can go in wearing a consultation model. In other words, they're going to go in, they're going to see the patient, identify the needs, and then contact the most responsible physician who, in the community, usually is the family physician. Um, or a nurse practitioner in the in the hospital could be the attending physician and then make recommendations to say, look, this is what we found and this is what you can do. Um, and sometimes follow up until the patient is stable. At the other end of the spectrum, there is um, I as a physician arrive and I take over all the care. I become the most responsible physician. And in the middle of this model is a shared care model where the family doctor remains the most responsible physician or the nurse practitioner, um, but a lot of the palliative care aspects are done by the palliative care team. So it's in between. Um, but all these, all these models have got their pros and cons, and all of them have a role to play in different times, in different contexts. The disruption part here is where, when I've met up with sometimes concerns 
and sometimes with hostility and strong hostility when I've suggested that we are doing too much takeover, uh, particularly in Ontario, um, because what's happening is we are now de-skilling family physicians or, or, or sending the message that they don't have a role to play um, and we're taking it over. Now, the dilemma here is that sometimes we have to because there's no family doctor. But I think we can do a lot more going into the future to support the family doctor, the nurse practitioners in the community. They need support. They're exhausted as well. And I acknowledge that. And so the time has come where I think we may need to think outside the box. Uh, and there are models where we can do that. For example, what if what if one of our nurse practitioners was allocated, seconded to family health teams or to community health centers and became their support? What if some of the palliative care physicians, if they had a funding model that provided them a fair, a, a fair competitive salary instead of a fee-for-service which only pays clinical work and no supportive quality improvement work, um, what if there was a fair alternative funding plan to allow the doctors to go in and support these folks more so that they can learn and be supported in providing palliative care? We studied this and we actually published this um, last year. Um, Abby may be one of our residents. Um, sorry, I've got a message here saying annotation request. Oh, sorry. Um, for everyone attending, please refrain from clicking buttons to ask to annotate. Greatly appreciated. Thank you. So shall I decline or shall I just hit the close? I'll click, okay, I've hit the close, good. Okay, so we studied this and Abby and the team interviewed uh, 14 physicians working in the community. Four of them worked in the consultation model. Eight worked in a takeover model in the community. When a take, takeover model is appropriate in some times, if it's a very complex case, it makes absolute sense. Um, and, and there's, I would say, an ethical imperative for someone with, a lot of experience and training in a particular area to take over when it's very complex. Um, but I would argue that perhaps it's not the best model when it's primary level pad of care, um, which is not complex. And we see sometimes specialists taking over over there. Two of the people were transitioning from, uh, from a takeover model to a consultation model. And we found different motivators for the two practice models. The takeover model is palliative care physicians primarily vote, motivated by their relationships with patients. So the important common ground here is that no matter what model is, everyone's trying their best and everyone wants the best for the patient. In the consultation model, the motivation is more, if I build up the capacity with primary care, if I teach them how to fish, they'll have fish for a lifetime. Um, if I take over, they're not going to have that. So differing motivations and, and drivers. I think one of the drivers, and this is like the elephant in the room um, that often people don't want to talk about, but I think it's so important. And as we've done this review in this one region, it's a, a theme that comes up over and over and over again, and that is the funding model. Fee for service drives people to do a certain thing, as does a consult or a salary and we need to get this fixed. Um, I can tell you stories about that, but I'm not going to go into that now. Where we've been trying since I arrived in the province in 2008 in Ontario, and since then I've been trying to get a proper AFP in place, and it just runs into one barrier after another. Anyway, we, going forward, we need to think of a, a systems thinking. We have to stop buying cars that only have one or two very good wheels. We have to start developing cars that have got all the components, all the wheels, the engine, the whole block and everything. In other words, what happens at home affects the hospitals. What happens in hospitals affects the home. What happens in the hospitals affects long-term care. What happens in long-term care affects the hospitals. We need all, all these pieces of the puzzle um, to, to move forward. We can't just fix one element. We, we can fix each of the elements that needs to be fixed thinking as a system. We also have to recognize that the healthcare system is a complex system. And there's some fantastic papers on this. I would really uh, encourage everyone to read, it, uh, the, read this report going back already to 2002 by Globerman and Zimmerman. Um, they were commissioned by 
um, the Government of Canada to look at it as part of the whole uh, review of the healthcare system back in tw so 20, what's it, 21 years ago. Um, and this fantastic paper came out of that uh, complicated and complex systems, what would successful reform of Medicare look like? And they articulate so beautifully how we've got to approach this as a complex system. And the, and the example they give is, uh, for example, is um, the difference between Brazil and South Africa in their responses to the HIV and AIDS crisis. Brazil said, we're going to make these medications available to, all, to, to our citizens. We're going to say this is a problem, but we're going to give hope by saying, look, there are medications that we can give uh, to help you. In South Africa, um, the ministry and the government at the time turned a blind eye to it. And and what unfolded was, over time, much more control of the disease in Brazil as compared to South Africa. There's another fantastic paper follow-up, and that's this one um, by Valerius, Healthcare's Wicked Questions, a Complexity Approach. So um, one of the key things around complexity is that it's got, we have to be organic and flexible and agile because we're going to come up against different barriers and we need to be able to move around them. So let's design the system and policies and procedures such as rules around APPs, rules around nurse practitioners where they can or cannot work that allows us to, to, to be flexible and, um, and navigate um, so that we can address the needs instead of getting our uh, um, shackled down into uh, these policies. If we are going to train up the whole workforce, it is time now to throw in a lot of resources. Work done um, many years ago um, about the you know the, the tipping point. So Everett Rogers came up with the theory of diffusion of innovation. And the theory is basically that when you've got something new that you want to spread around, and, and that's good, right? Sometimes new things are not always good. Um, um, but um, you're going to find that the first two, two and a half percent are the innovators, then the next two, two and a half percent are the early adopters. And then you go into the early majority that start adopting it. And once you've got that going there, then it reaches a tipping point and also very beautifully written in the book called The Tipping Point by Gladwell. Then it takes its own energy and then change starts occurring. So by the time it gets to here, then all healthcare professionals in a, let's just say, a heart clinic or a long-term care facility or a nursing home uh, uh, or a, a home care agency will say, it is part of our job and we've got to do part of care, we've got to do part of care training, it's part of what we do. Um, I think that this diffusion of innovation still holds truth, but I think we're still here in the beginning. Um, we've been tracking this at Pallium. For paramedics, I think we've reached the tipping point and over, which is fantastic. Um, but in other areas, you know, resources are being put into some areas, but not into educating um, on the part of care approach. and. I want to highlight that it's not just about education. Education is important and a requirement, but by itself is not sufficient. We have to do policies and processes, um, put in place the investments of teams, etc., to be able to do this, to make this happen. By the way, this is an interesting take on the on the um, diffusion of innovation, um, where someone said, "Look, actually, we need extra effort in." as we move beyond the early adopters to get to the early majority, because if we don't, we fall into this crevice that we don't come out of. And so there's extra attention and different messaging required. The message required here is, you know what? These folks are already doing this. Come on, we should be doing this. So in other words, the message changes from over here was, come look at this, see what the benefits are, try it out, help us modify it, help us improving it. Um, if you keep going with that message up here, you might not get uptake here. So at this point in time, the message and the resources have changed to, there are others doing it already. Come on, you've got to get on board. That's another fantastic book by Francis Wesley and the team, um, Getting to Maybe um, and How the World is Changing. I need to read this because I, 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 I need to read both of these, the introduction to the book and then the preface in the book. This book is for those who are not happy with the way things are and would like to make a difference. This book is for ordinary people who want to make connections that will create extraordinary outcomes. This is a book about making the impossible happen. This book is not for heroes or saints or perfectionists. 
this book is for flawed people and we are all flawed in one way or another who are not happy with the way things are and would like to make a difference. And I would argue all of us are in this. Um, and so let's make the change that's required. Let's do the, the courageous leadership that's needed. There's other good things like you know, Good to Great, this book by Jim Collins that says some of the key ideas is find your hedgehog concept. Um, um, and that will give you a clear path. And the analogy he uses to describe this is, imagine that there's a sly uh, fox who's trying to um, catch a hedgehog and eat the hedgehog and spends hours and hours trying to figure out different ways of how to surprise the hedgehog, how to um, ambush it. And the hedgehog just sticks to this one plan. Every time it's, uh, it feels threatened, turns into a ball and spikes and cannot get captured by the by the fox. So the, the story here is that sometimes you need to stick to something that works well and stick to it and just be persistent and keep, and keep um, going at it. Um, success comes from tiny incremental pushes in the right direction many times. But again, as I said, sometimes you need just one big change. Um, level five, uh, so, uh, I'm sorry, the right people in the right place are the foundation of greatness. And I think we are all, we can all be at the right place at the right time, even in our small little ways. Success requires confronting reality and never losing faith. And leaders must create an environment where harsh facts can be aired without hesitation. The elephants in the room, for example. I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. And let's go to priorities for a reset and then time to stop. The main point here is that if we are going to address all the needs of patients with serious illnesses, the cancer, the kidney diseases, patients with, with chronic um, lung diseases, patients with cerebrovascular disease, with heart diseases, patients with neuro, uh, neurological diseases. And we are going to have to do that earlier in the illness because there's now, I would argue, more than enough evidence to show that early part of care is much better for patients, for families, for the healthcare system than part of care only very late then we're going to have to adopt a public health approach and a public health model. And this model described in this fantastic paper by Jan Stonswart and Kathy Foley and Frank Ferris uh, back in 2007 is basically the public health approach is that it's everyone's business. In other words, palliative care is not delivered only by a group of specialists, palliative care physicians, nurses, pharmacists, social workers, psychologists, etc. It is the responsibility of everyone, and that includes the whole community and society. And we should leverage the, the power that exists in, in societies and in communities. And so you see this wonderful uh, movement of compassionate communities coming forward. But it also means that in addition to policies, we also need to do education and train up and support and hold the hands and coach. I'm surprised how often in some jurisdictions um, in ho hospices, I think, are these amazing opportunities to train and support and coach family physicians in providing palliative care. And I understand that in some communities, the family docs are not doing it or don't want to do it, don't come up to do it. But sometimes there are opportunities where they would do it. Why don't we open up that as an opportunity to coach them and teach them? Yes, it would add extra, a bit of extra work. Yes, it mean coaching, but things start changing over time and the coaching becomes less as they become more comfortable. And then they can then perhaps show the resonance that they're teaching on how to do this. And then they start role modeling this part of care uh, approach. As I said, we've seen the compassionate communities. Studies after studies showing the impact of part of care uh, reducing hospital visits, reducing emergency uh, visits, um, increasing home deaths. And in this particular fantastic paper by Kieran Quinn and the team out of Toronto, Hamilton and Ottawa, um, concluded in this study that 
um, increasing access to palliative care through sustained investment of physician and other professions training and current models of collaborative palliative care could improve end of life care, which might have important implications for health policy. So they make the case of this public health approach where it's everyone's business and the story after story of family clinics, primary care clinics doing this and doing it well. Here's a story of the Brewer Academic Family Health Team that took on ownership of providing primary palliative care and their doctors also seeing patients in the local hospices. There's a story here um, of, um, of uh, Dr. Uh, Declan uh, who uh, helped in the Petawawa Family Health Team uh, um, take ownership of palliative care and they're doing an amazing job. There's the Jane Finch Clinic in Toronto who already back in 2015 said this is part of the work we do let's get trained up and let's look at our policies and processes and let's find a way of putting together a call service to look after these patients because they are our patients and in our model we do provide cradle to grave care in nova scotia how they bring on board more primary care we've seen earlier papers by you know, work by denise marshall about a shared care model supporting primary care we see stories from manitoulin um, island on how it's uh, done. Um, there is um, one of the studies that I was involved in, we, we, we did a survey of family health teams and community health centers, nurse practitioner-led clinics in Ontario. Um, we actually um, reached out to 328 clinics in Ontario, um, a few uh, just over 100 in, um, in Eastern Quebec. A response rate come, came back of about 32%. And what we saw was that um, there are gaps without a doubt. In Ontario, 56% of practices indicated that they had access to palliative care physicians who could take over the care of the patients. Um, but alone, so about 44% said they handed over the care. I think it's actually higher um, after the pandemic. And I, understandably, we just interviewed a family physician leader in the clinic who said we just overwhelmed. Um, but we also found that there were about 28% of, um, of these clinics that are providing on-call palliative care services. Now, here's the narrative. Why do we keep sticking to a narrative that says family doctors will never do it, they won't do it? Why isn't the narrative, there are people doing it. How is it happening? How can we support them to do it? How can we build that 28% and take it and take it bigger? And there's examples, the Integrate project that we did um, in Ontario and Eastern Quebec, um, where we showed that it is possible to get them on board. Sometimes I feel like saying people who say it cannot be done should not interrupt those who are already doing it. There's opportunity for reorganization, as I said, to support primary palliative care. And I'm not just talking about in primary care, but in the hospitals and long-term care facilities, etc. But there's an opportunity for us to relook at the funding models and say, listen, let's get this right. Let's fix it up. We've been talking about this now for 15, 16 years. Um, let's remunerate the clinicians properly, all the staff across all the professions and sectors. There was work done on how to build a regional program. At the moment, with the reshuffling in the whole healthcare system as we move towards OHTs and the Ontario Health, it's a, it's a time of great disruption, without a doubt. And people had stuff that got lost and people are looking for some direction. There are examples of how it can be done. And, and um, this is a paper we published um, of work done in 2009, 2010, 2011 to establish what I think today is a, is a strong regional palliative care approach in the Champlain region. And that's all uh, described, all the steps we did, um, the facilitators in, and enablers of that process, how everyone got together. There's examples from colleagues up in your uh, neck of the woods um, um, at Lake Ridge, at Nossum, fantastic leaders on developing rural models for palliative care, using that same model and putting it into long-term care. All this from, from, from your neck of the woods, things that we are leveraging and building on. We've learned about different palliative care models. Um, Sharon Carson and her team have described the different models. So there's, there are things there that we can uh, learn and there are resources like Pallium and the quality improvement toolkits on how to uh, identify patients in practices. 
what Pallium did was it took the OPCN, the, the, the excellent uh, resource on identifying um, patients in practices, and then operationalized that into step-by-step -step, um, QI uh, processes that clinics can adapt. So having said all that, uh, I think we are three steps forward and two steps back, and I think it still means moving. It that means we are moving forward, which is a good thing. There's fantastic opportunities for courageous leadership. Um, some we just need some tweaks and evolution. In others, we need a complete fix and a redo, the um, uh, a complete revamp in some places. And with my background in, in Africa, having lived there for 28 years. And this is a, a quote that I often heard there and love. And it's, if you want to travel fast, travel alone. If you want to travel far, travel together. And with that, I want to thank you. And uh, I'm sorry, I didn't give enough time, but I hope there's still time to discuss and share insights. So, absolutely. Thank you so much. I found that very therapeutic to go back and take a look at it all, and I really appreciate listening to all your key ideas. So thank you. Uh, we do have some questions thank in you. the chat Thanks box. So. Yeah, sure. and, and so um, I, the first question is framing around your long-term care discussion, um, and wondering if you could talk a little bit more about have we learned anything um, that's going to make systems changes that you'll see in long-term care? Where are we kind of at there? Well, in Ontario, I think it's actually exciting because in Ontario, what's happened is there's a law now, right? So there's a law now in place that um, that obligates long-term care facilities, homes to improve, among others, palliative and end-of-life care. So I think that's that's fantastic, um, and an an amazing opportunity. We're just going to make sure that we choose the right model. I, I glanced very quickly through one of those slides, but it was the work by Sharon and her team where they did this big review of the different models that can be applied. And model one was where um, you just bring in an ex exterior expert to do the part of care and that's it. Um, so, uh, and then there was model four and in model four, you build internal capacity with a palliative care approach. So all the staff know how to do that. You've got a champion in that you've changed policies and procedures, and you've got access to a specialist palliative care team. So that could be a nurse practitioner, a doctor can come in and help. And Sharon makes the case that we should, that model four is the one that should be adopted more often. So I think that there are exciting things happening and there are models to guide us and examples across the country on how it's uh, happening well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Julie is uh, commenting that the Ontario government has taken a step towards privatization of some healthcare services, and she's worried that access to palliative care could be at risk if it becomes less of a priority in an increasingly strained system. What are you and Pallium seeing, re the commitment to maintaining or even increasing palliative care access in Canada? So it's interesting, you know, this whole argument about privatization and public. I mean, I've always been a supporter of the public, but I also see in some other countries where uh, privatization can be done very effectively, can be done well, and also where it has led to a failure to uphold the public system. A point, a case in point, South Africa and Portugal, where there's become too much reliance on the public, but I think some sort of collaborative could work. Now, Interestingly, at Pallium, we've got two partnerships with two private entities that have come to us and say, we want to improve this. We want to be the best possible in providing good part of end of life care. And they've committed resources to it and they've put it, resources into it. So still early, early phase of it. Um, but I thought that that is courageous leadership on their part to, to really step up and, and improve uh, the act. And, and, and those are companies that go across the uh, several provinces, not just Ontario. Okay, great. Um, and Gary is asking, how could Ontario adopt or adapt the goals of care models that is so helpful for symptom management and end of life care in Alberta? Uh, um, um, so, I, so I think he's maybe talking that we there was um, maybe the goals of care model that's been helpful and wondering um, oh. how could Ontario adopt this or yeah, so how could Ontario adopt, yeah. adapt the goals of care model that is so helpful for symptom management and end of life care in Alberta? 
So maybe commenting if Ontario is using it. So I don't know exactly what he's referring to, but I'm going to assume that he's referring to the levels of care. So yeah. Um, um, so I he says actually, yes, exactly. That was it. Okay. <laughs> um, so I was actually living in Alberta and working in Alberta at the time when that started happening. And if if I recollect um, accurately, what was happening was we had different hospitals with di different levels of care. So one hospital had level one, level two, level three, where one was full resuscitation and three was stop everything and do palliative care, right? So already there's a red flag there. When these levels just say stop everything and do palliative care, it's equating palliative care with only very end of life and withdrawing everything and goes against the whole messaging of and, 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 and necessity of of, of moving pad of care much earlier. But what is even more complicated in Calgary when I was at the time, for example, was that another hospital had at the, the flip of that system. So three was full resuscitation. One was, was the pad of care, uh, stop everything and do pad of care. So I think two fantastic things happened. One was they took away that numbering system, as it were, and, and made it very clear um, um, uh, uh, what these different levels were and moved the pa thinking of palliative care only for the last days and withdrawals of treatment. So if you look there at the goals of care um, uh, protocol or, or grid, you'll see that palliative care appears not just only at the very end of life earlier. But the other very good thing that they did was that they had all the institutions, all the health service providers adopt the same thing. So now you've got a common language across the whole province. And I don't know why that hasn't why that has not happened in Ontario. Um, I think sometimes we we forget to look at at folks elsewhere and adopt and what's working, and we try and reinvent the wheel the whole time. And that happens with education as well. Um, it's so frustrating, for example, when we've spent millions of dollars of public dollars in with pallium building building stuff, building things up, and then you hear narratives of oh, you know, but they've got no evidence. Well, look, there is evidence. We've published the evidence. Or oh, we need to develop something different for whatever reason. And there's different motives for that. And sometimes it is appropriate. But what if we collaborated, taking what we exist, what already exists, and tweak it and help it and, 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 and evolve it? So in Ontario, I think we've been stopped. Um, I don't know why. Um, it's interesting because... I was involved in a project at the Hamilton Health Sciences to, to re-look at these levels. And they still stuck to the numbers and they still stuck to pad of care only at the very end of life. And I was blue in the face saying, look, this is not, we've got to re redo this and here's the Ontario ones. So I, I didn't see the end of that and I'm hoping that those changes were made. Gary, I, I hope that that's what you were asking about. And I don't have an answer to you for you. <laughs> He says, yes, thanks. Okay. okay. Uh, so Susan uh, Mintz is asking, how do you integrate the patient's care preferences into your individualized approach to their palliative care plan? By, by applying the palliative care approach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think, you know, that is inherent in palliative care, um, in making, in, in listening, um, looking at the different domains, the different dimensions. Um, when I, uh, and by that I mean the physical needs, the psychological, the spiritual, the social needs, making sure that people are informed and helping uh, and opening up the space for a dialogue and to listen to what's important for them, what the values are for them. And I think that that is inherent in the pad of care approach and something that we that we try and convey that's my role I'm doing here now um, in, uh, in, in Spain is helping train um, the students in the medical school to do that. We did it in, in, in Hamilton, at McMaster, in Ottawa, um, so that the next generation of healthcare professionals and the existing one can, are able to do that. If the question was about who initiates the conversation, then I think one of the big errors that's often made is that we as healthcare professionals, we as physicians or nurses, wait for the patients and the families to initiate the discussion. And you see that happening a lot. And so part of the training is learning how to, to initiate that discussion. 
and there's and there's different models on how to do that. One, for example, is that the wish I wish I I, I wish I wonder I oh gosh now I've, um, I wish I worry I wonder. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I wish I could be sitting here and telling you better news that the disease is under control, but I don't want to lie to you. Um, so I think we need to talk about, you know, what is your understanding about what's happening? And, and let me share with you what I'm seeing and, and what I've seen in the tests. Um, and I wonder if there's another way that we can approach this. What else is, you know, what, what's important for you? Um, and, um, and then move the conversation from there. So there's some really good um, resources in all the provinces and nationally, the Speak Up campaign on how to do that. Uh, that's an inherent part of all the LEAP courses is to to try uh, get those competencies across. Great. Thank you very much. I think that's it for our questions. So thank you so much for your talk today. It was very informative and I so appreciate all the reading. <laughs> You've given us at least a couple of years worth, so that's great. <laughs> so thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's great. It's always good to know good titles. Uh, so thanks very much. And um, I just want to remind everybody that the evaluation for the session will be in the chat box. And I believe we start our next presentation at 245. And again, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Pereira. It was lovely. And thanks again for the opportunity. Bye and keep well, everyone. Bye bye.